Okay, so let's let's pivot now and talk a little bit about uh, the the sort of states of ejaculation. Uh, so so inorgasmia, delayed orgasm, etc. Um, uh, how does the prevalence of this differ by age? Yeah, so ejaculatory dysfunctions are important. We know that thirty percent of men, thirty percent of men, are likely to have some type, degree of ejaculatory dysfunction. More prominent is premature ejaculation, right? So premature ejaculation. Uh, 30% of men, up to 30% will have it. Only 9% of that 30% will seek therapy. It's really small. And that's really because many men are embarrassed to seek therapy about this. So basically 30% of men have this. Only 3% of men in total are doing anything about it. 9% of the... Nine percent. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, no. it, which is very small. But in, you know, two years ago, the guidelines came out. The new guidelines came out. So, what is a premature ejaculation? Yeah. Two ways to think about it. And this is really important how you break it up at the beginning. It's either lifelong or acquired. That's your first step. Has this patient had it ever since they remember having sex, and they can always have premature ejaculation, or was this acquired? In either case, you have to have three variables. You must have these three. One, you have to have a decreased ejaculatory time. Now, when it's lifelong, it's typically now less than two minutes, right? So it's less than two minutes. It used to be less than one. Now it's less than two. But they have to have a sense of loss of control. I couldn't control it. And number three, they have to be bothered by it. If a guy comes in and says, I ejaculate in 30 seconds and I'm happy, well, great. He doesn't have the problem. He has to be bothered by it, right? So it's important. What if he's not bothered by it, but his partner is? Well, it's he has to be bothered by it, right? Okay. So if he's bothered that she's bothered, fine, but he has to be bothered by the condition, right? Okay. Now, acquired is a little bit different. So look, things were great till I hit 40, and all of a sudden I developed premature ejaculation. Same principles. You have to be bothered by the condition. You have to have a sense of loss of control, and you have to have a decrease in time. Now, how do you define time? That's a little bit tricky on this one because it's anywhere from two to three minutes or it's 50% of your typical time. Mm. So let's say I used to ejaculate in 10 minutes and now it's five. Okay, that qualifies. It's 50% yep. of what my... So these are the two definitions of... Uh, so you want to break it down. Now, why is that important? Because how I treat somebody is very different, right? If someone's acquired, we start looking at hormones. That's important. We look at prolactin. We look at thyroid. We look at testosterone. Mm. We look at some more diagnostic. If it's lifelong, we don't do a lot of diagnostic workup. You're not supposed to. It's the acquired where you start figuring out, you know, the four reasons for this uh, premature ejaculation. One is the biological, the theory that there's increased sensitivity of the glands. Hmm. Right. So if they're born with increased sensitivity, that's why one of the therapies is using lidocaine or some of these numbing agents on the glands. They're over the counter. There's sprays that actually lidocaine on the penis 10 minutes prior to engaging in sexual activity. But doesn't that then put lidocaine onto the partner? You wipe it off before you engage in sexual activity. I see. And okay. so and 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 but be careful because if you spray too much, it causes ED. Yeah. Right. So that's one. Uh, so it's the biological. There's a bi the, there's a neurobiological, essentially meaning the neurotransmitters. So essentially that there's too little serotonin. Um, it, it, the neurotransmitters are causing an impairment for the ejaculation. There's some belief on genetic. Uh, we don't have an assay right now, but there mm. are four four genes that have been implicated. Um, there's some gene. But these genes are only implicated in lifelong or in acquired. Uh, in acquired. Uh, sorry, it's, it's going to be lifelong. I'm sorry, okay, and yep. there's polymorphism of the, the and they're they're the they're the receptor they're neurosteroid receptor genes, right? And there are four of them, but we don't use this clinically. We don't look for the assay. We just yep. know that more studies need to be done. And uh, the last one's important. It's psychological, right? If you have um, a new relationship, stress, um, any kind of uh, that, that causes some psychological impairment, that can actually cause premature. Do you have a sense of why stress can have? opposite effects. Why is it that in one man, stress might result in ED, and in another man, it might result in no difficulty with an erection, but premature ejaculation? Yeah, I think it's how you interpret. I don't I can't answer that. I don't know the answer. I don't, do know that stress, though, significantly in effect you in all sexual function. I call it SAD. It's stress, anxiety, and depression. Patients suffer from those. So stress can have a significant imp impact on all forms of sexual dysfunction, right? And so, but stress, stress has a huge impact when it comes to sexual dysfunction. A lot of men, yeah. when the stress have difficulty getting an erection, um, and so, it, but it does affect premature ejaculation as well. So these are the reasons why men have it. So how do you treat it? There's some treatment options. And the first line therapy typically is the spray I was talking about, lidocaine spray that you can use. We use promescent, it's over the counter, it's easy to get. The second one you can use typically is SSRIs. So antidepressants. But some men say, 
I don't want to take an antidepressant. Um, I say, okay, you don't have to take it every day, although it works best if you take it every day, but you can take it on demand. The problem with on demand is you got to take it six to eight hours ahead of time. Yeah, which is counterintuitive, right? Because one of the side effects of an, an SSRI is reduction in libido, right? And ED, both, and yeah. reduction in libido. So you're right. Uh, so, so you just have to realize that those are, and then first line therapy should always be sex therapy. This is one area where sex therapy is very effective. And sex therapists are what, what is the formality of training to be a sex therapist? Uh, they, they are certified. You have to have a certification. From typically sex, psychologists or uh, psychiatrists? You, uh, typically psychologists, not psychiatrists, but psychiatrists can be, uh, uh certified in sex therapy. Okay. But um, these, uh, they're very helpful because there's two techniques, the start-stop technique, the squeeze technique that teach patients how to prolong the ejaculate. Mm -hmm. But again, a lot of times patients say, just give me the pill. I say, fine. I mean, but if they did the work, that's a cure, yeah. right? That's a cure for PE. Um, so, so those are the first-line therapies. There are second-line therapies. The two second-line therapies are tramadol a narcotic, right? And actually has been shown, if you look at the ejaculatory time, less than one minute, a lot of studies show, show up to seven minutes. The problem is- A it, narcotic? Yes. And it's been used quite often as a treatment and it's in the guidelines as a, as a, as a What's therapy. What's the risk of addiction or exacerbation of- Very high. Yeah. And so that's why I had a patient once that started using you know five a month, then he started asking for 10 a month. And then once he called for 30 a month and I said, this is ridiculous. He goes, well, I'm having sex every day. I want it every, and I could tell he was getting addicted, yeah. right? And I said, I, I can't do this anymore. You know, so, so you just have to be careful on the tram at all. Uh, and then actually uh, alpha blockers, Flomax, uh, second yep, line therapy uh, for for uh, premature ejaculation. Yeah. Right. So now, does that sometimes convert premature into retrograde? You can. So right, that's one of the risk factors for yeah. the alpha blockers retrograde, but it prolongs the ejaculatory time. You know. So so these are the treatment options that we use for patients, and they're quite effective. And you just kind of go through the algorithm uh, for PE. Explain what a retrograde ejaculation is. So think about what happens when the. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier in the prostate, there's something called the ejaculatory ducts. So think of it like a T, okay? So the ejaculatory ducts are coming up, moving forward is the urethra, and it's coming out the urethra, moving backward is the bladder. So when the sperm comes up and the seminal fluid comes up, the tendency is for the fluid to go back into the bladder. But as a man has an ejaculate, he closes off the bladder neck. So the fluid cannot get into the bladder, it's forced to go out. But when you take a medication like an alpha blocker or certain other medications, it can actually open the bladder neck. So what happens is the sperm comes up, seminal fluid then goes into the bladder. And so nothing comes out of the urethra. And when the man urinates or voids, then the seminal fluid will come out. Is there any harm of a retrograde ejaculation? No harm at all. Just some patients find it annoying. Yep. Obviously it would <laughs> impair reproduction. So <laughs> For sure. So yep. if someone's trying to have a child, we Huge would not problem. be. Yeah. Yep. Thank you.